Howdy! Did you ever watch much of PBS Kids growing up? Either way, it spawned a lot of memorable shows, from Sesame Street to Mr. Rogers to Arthur. And a pocket full of shows I'd really rather not remember, like Caillou. Ugh. But overall, PBS was a staple of many American childhoods. But over 26 years, any network's gonna have its share of stinker episodes, no matter how careful. Sometimes, the writers might botch up the morals completely, or just make a downright boring episode. So, let's give them a look today. Let's check out the Top 10 Worst PBS Kids Episodes. Also, I think it's well worth mentioning, I have nothing but respect for the PBS Kids Network, and all the quality programming they've offered to people over the years. Particularly shows like Sesame Street, which I consider the best kid show of all time. So keep in mind, I only consider these bad by PBS standards. Anyway, on to the countdown. For the place snatching! <laughs> I got it! I love this neighborhood! I love it! <laughs> Sesame Street. Big Bird considers moving. So apparently, this is one of the lowest rated Sesame Street episodes on IMDb. Huh, I wonder why. Well, let's take a look together and try and figure it out. So, did you know Sesame Street has uh, rapping real estate agents? Birds have real estate agents? I know, right Gordon? Perhaps the town would have been perfectly fine without rapping real estate agents. Take a look around at a new habitat. It makes me want to clap. And it but makes let's press on, shall we? First off, just a quick reminder, this is nothing against the actors personally. Everyone in this cast does a fantastic job as always. I just don't think our real estate buddy fits in very well to the other characters of Sesame Street. You see, this episode stars Freddie Flatman. Another sale by Freddie Flatman, Flikert Real Estate. And his goal is to sell Big Bird some real estate. For the entire episode, our buddy Big Bird is repeatedly hard-sold and pushed into moving to another habitat by our buddy Freddy, who uses real estate agent Magic to rap about different habitats. Of every color, animals of every size, two cans, macaws, monkeys, frogs, sloths, butterflies, lots of animals above, lots of animals below, a rainforest is the perfect place. Repeatedly, in songs that feel copy-pasted from the YouTube audio library. Seriously, for 13 minutes, they managed to shove in a lot of these strange habitat rap songs. Honestly, I'm surprised this used car salesman type even made it through the Sesame Street gates. I feel like there must be a, you must be this honest to enter sign at the entryway. By the end, Big Bird's absolutely torn about leaving all his friends behind, but Freddy just keeps pushing him to make the sale, winking to the camera, which makes him feel pretty dang out of place in this town. Big Bird mostly isn't interested, but eventually, Flatman does make the sale and convinces Big Bird to move to the rainforest. But when he starts saying goodbye, almost all of the town of Sesame Street comes out to try and convince him to stay. But if Big Bird leaves, Big Bird won't be able to see all of his friends anymore. The rainforest is very, very far away. And it's a really warm moment for the show. And in the end, they do convince him to stay. However, Every Sesame Street episode I've ever seen has pluses, and I refuse to not mention them, even in a worse list. And the pluses to this one? I think it's a mild cultural introduction to rapping for young kids. And I think it teaches kids about our vulnerability to be influenced by marketing, salesman pitches, and hard selling. And to be careful about being caught up in that excitement or emotion when making big decisions. So yeah, not a great Sesame Street episode, but still very early on the list. <laughs> and for the ninth worst PBS Kids episode, Arthur. So funny I forgot to laugh. A dangerous symptom of the long-running show is how writers sometimes rehash old plots from previous episodes. And Arthur is no different. Sorry I Forgot to Laugh contains the exact same conflict of the very first episode of the series, Arthur's Eyes. But the moral and characters in this episode were so horribly botched that I'd swear the storyboard writers were swapped out for a pack of monkeys. You know, the kind that steal your sunglasses and ransom them back to you for food. Dang mobsters. Anyway, Arthur in particular feels completely out of character, and continually acts like a nasty jerk that took a stupid pill in the morning. You see, the episode revolves around Sue Ellen wearing a large coat she received as a gift from her Tibetan pen pal. Aww, that's nice. But when she arrives at school wearing the sweater, Arthur makes a passing joke that she looks like a sheepdog. Which she initially takes with a laugh. Hey, you know what? It kind of makes you look like a big sheepdog. <laughs> that's true! <laughs> But apparently Arthur considers this passing comment the most hilarious joke in the world, and just continually torments her with it. You left your backpack behind! Bad dog! Come here, girl! Over here! Who's a good sheep doggy? 
You're a good sheep doggy. Jeering about her apparent sheep dogginess? How does she even remotely look like a sheep dog anyway? Arthur, have you ever even seen a sheep dog? It's really not a similar look. I'm sorry to reiterate, but this is seriously like the dumbest joke in the world. Yet Arthur just keeps dragging it out through the whole episode. His friends only gave him a pity laugh to begin with. But apparently since Arthur plans to die on this sinking ship, he just keeps beating this sad, dead horse of a joke. Finally, Sue Ellen reports this rude behaviour to Mr. Ratburn, who scolds Arthur and assigns him to write a letter of apology. But Arthur is so absolutely certain that this joke is the most amazing thing ever stated, that he writes Sue a non-apology. This causes Sue, Buster, Francine and Muffy to give Arthur the dreaded, silent treatment. What's going on? We're not speaking to you! That's what's going on! This silent treatment is one of the many odd, puzzling decisions the writing team took when writing this episode, as Arthur's friends only worsen the situation by not communicating. The lack of communication prolongs the problem for no good reason other than, I guess, dragging out the episode's runtime? But the episode encourages children to give this silent treatment to their friends, even when their friends have no idea what they did wrong. How does Arthur not already understand how Sue Ellen feels anyway? Arthur's already been bullied by Francine to the point where he stopped wearing glasses altogether in episode 1. But in this episode, he's forgotten all that apparently, and is uncharacteristically cruel and callous, continuing to stand by his burning ship as it sinks. Arthur photoshops a shot of Sue Ellen with a sheepdog's head and emails it to her. I should probably be saddened by Arthur's cruelty, but honestly at this point, I just have to admire his commitment to this bit. Like he's willing to burn all the bridges of his friendships just in order to try and make this joke work. But in the end, he does realise the error of his sheepdoggy ways, so he sincerely apologises and the two make up. Apparently, the terrible writing is the main reason people dislike this episode. The characters either act uncharacteristically cold and cruel, inconsistent or hypocritical. Sorry I Forgot to Laugh feels like a mess of bad character writing and confused morals, and I consider it one of the worst episodes of Arthur. This dog might just get angry and bite you. Oh, you wouldn't do that. Never a cup around when you need one. <laughs> Number eight. Thomas the Tank Engine. Edward strikes out. Okay, to start with, with all respects to the narrator Michael, is he on strike for this episode? He sounds absolutely foaming with resentment here. All the engines of Sodor are very happy to work on the Fat Controller's railway. Maybe Michael wasn't so keen on the episode either. I don't know. He normally sounds amazing. Okay, Michael, our new 2006 rules state we have to talk to the kids like they're idiots. So, you know, door it up a bit. Edward's trucks were right by the new crane. So what beef do most people have with Edward Strikes Out? Well, in this episode, our heroes Edward and Gordon become prejudiced and downright horrible. What have the kids learnt today? This episode teaches them about the art of name-calling and discriminating against those that are different. You see, when Edward and Gordon spot a new crane named Rocky, the two of them decide he's useless because he's different, and spend a surprisingly large portion of the episode just fobbing him off and insulting him. That crane might be big, Gordon sniffed, but he has no engine. Newfangled nonsense. He's a crane without an engine. Therefore, they deduct he's completely useless on Sodor. So Edward and Gordon come up with some repeated jeers for him, such as newfangled nonsense even right next to him. It makes these two previously relatively nice engines come off as strangely elitist and nasty, which is a really puzzling thing to see in a Thomas episode. Anyway, while on the way to deliver his freight of pipes to their destination, Edward accidentally breaks too suddenly and scatters the pipe cargo all over the tracks. Thomas had said Rocky was very strong. Newfangled nonsense. Oh, stop calling Rocky names for five minutes, you twit. Let him help you. Edward's driver calls for the crane Harvey to come help, but unfortunately, his tiny crane can only lift one pipe at a time. When even Thomas is delayed, he asks a legitimate question of why Rocky can't help. No, no, whistled Edward. Harvey is doing a fine job. We must be patient. Oh, you silly prejudiced twit. Just get on with it. 
Soon, Gordon arrives at the scene at high speed, crashing into the pipes head on and derailing. You fangled not. Oh, don't you start too, Gordon. There's no real big development here. We pretty much just watch Edward be a stick in the mud for the whole episode until he finally gets Rocky. He solves the mess in no time, with Edward and Gordon realizing he's just as productive as the rest of them. While I do appreciate the writer's effort to make the characters feel relatable and realistic, Edward and Gordon just come off as callous and cruel in this episode, continually jeering at poor Rocky. While Gordon and Edward do learn better by the end of the episode, the moral feels kind of bungled and confused here. However, I think Edward strikes out as simply below average and not truly appalling. Trust me, worse is definitely yet to come. Never a cup run when you need one. <laughs> and for the seventh worst PBS Kids episode, Sesame Street, Elmo's Fear of Clowns, and a song for the letter G. You know, for a kids show running since 1969 with 4,000 plus episodes, almost every episode of Sesame Street has been of reasonably good quality. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find one episode that is legitimately terrible beyond repair. So that's why for this one, I put two episodes for the one entry. These two episodes suffer from similar flaws. To start with, Elmo's Fear of Clowns drags on like no other episode I've ever seen. The episode focuses on, you guessed it, Elmo and how he is terrified of clowns. Telly and three children are all dressed as clowns because they find it funny to dress and act like one. To actually meet children that don't hate clowns is quite astonishing. Anyway, they try to invite Elmo to do the same, but he runs in fear once he sees them in costume. Gee. On a side note, why are clowns still in business anyway? Both kids and adults hate them. I'd invite Elsa to my party any day over the dreaded clown. Anyway, Elmo decides he doesn't want to be afraid of clowns anymore, and asks them to help overcome his fear. Telly and the kids try a bunch of different ideas, from slowly dressing Telly up as a clown in front of Elmo, to dressing Elmo up as a clown and showing him a mirror. They even have him repeat the phrase, Elmo's not afraid of clowns, ten times. While they certainly get points for creativity and resourcefulness, none of these attempts work, and it causes Telly to become sad, which lures Elmo to comfort him, despite being dressed up as a clown. In turn, overcoming his fear. The concept for the episode is great, especially for kids who are likely to be afraid of clowns themselves, but the episode moves at a downright snail's pace. An episode based on this premise would be more suited to maybe 8 minutes, but making this episode drag out for 15 entire minutes left me comatose with boredom by the end. There's a similar flaw in the episode, A Song for the Letter G, which is an episode revolving around, that's right, the letter G, good guess, who expresses how he can make different sounds depending on his placement, and feels he should have several songs dedicated to him. And if you don't like musical episodes and television shows, well, you're definitely not going to like this one, as it features a whole five songs in 13 minutes, which some may either find pleasant or incredibly draining. Definitely the latter for me. Also, the letter G is just picky and horrible, as no matter what song the crew come up with, G just never seems content with their efforts and continually demands that they come up with different songs. Honestly, I feel weird reaching the point in my job where I can state this, but Sesame Street's letter G is a big jerk. He's incredibly ungrateful for what they come up with, and it makes you wonder why they're even making a song for him to begin with. Oh, we use plenty of silent Gs. You better help me or how will we ever pronounce a uh, gnome or gnarled? Yeah. If you are a fan of long, continual musicals about the letter G, well, you have very specific taste, my friend, and you might like this episode. Otherwise, I suggest you stay far away from it. <laughs> Never a Number six. Ow. Arthur. DW's very bad mood. For me anyway, DW stands as one of the absolute worst cartoon characters I've ever seen. Many people see her as one of the main flaws of Arthur as a whole, and episodes involving her typically aren't well received. Which leads us to her greatest achievement in defining annoying in the dictionary. It's an entire episode revolving around DW and her awful behavior taking a toll on Arthur's family, and her parents constantly caving to her bad behavior, and even rewarding it for some reason. You're always picking on me! You never pick on anyone else! Only me! 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 
You know that's not true, DW. Honestly, writers, this is just psychology 101, operant conditioning. If you see a malicious behavior in someone, yes, we want to understand the reason behind said malicious behavior, but we also don't give such behavior a positive reinforcement, such as giving them ice cream or taking them to the movies. Perhaps some sort of negative punishment, such as removing movie privileges, so the person understands this behavior is not acceptable in normal society. Where to start with a awful behavior? We see her constantly making a commotion at night and depriving Arthur of sleep. I won't feel better in the morning. I won't, I won't, I won't! So right off the bat, the episode paints DW as a complete nuisance that plagues the entire household. She's also constantly spouting hateful, negative words at others. And her parents don't do anything about the issue. They just keep enabling this awful behavior. Feeling hopeless, Arthur mentions the issue to Francine, who tries to take matters into her own hands by asking DW what's wrong, which for some reason only upsets DW even more, leading to Francine and Arthur resorting to spying on DW to see if they can uncover anything about what's making her so upset. Why are they making this child the center of attention for a week due to having a temper tantrum? This is like the worst possible operant conditioning you could give a kid. If you act horrible to people all week, we will shower you with attention. This leads to yet another issue. DW's motivations are outright bizarre and silly. You see, DW's rotten attitude is due to not being invited to a birthday party, being held by someone she doesn't even like. Oh boy, I'm really empathizing with her now. Not. I understand that people can act irrational at times, but this is just beyond irrational. I'm really popular, and I usually get invited to a lot of birthday parties. Eventually, the episode abandons the idea of teaching DW a lesson at all, and instead Francine invites DW to her birthday party. Rather than the episode teaching children that they should try and resist getting jealous of the other people their friends know, the episode abandons any moral for the sake of a happy ending. All for a character that has done nothing but torment the main characters, and us, for an entire 11 minutes. But I'm not going to preschool either! I'm sick of preschool! I'll do what I want! Do you hear me? <sighs> DW's very bad mood is Caillou levels of unbearable. <laughs> and for number 5, Sesame Street indoor picnic. I swear, I've packed into this list the only four Sesame Street episodes to ever fumble their moral. Good luck hunting through the other 4,558 episodes to find any more. So today on Sesame Street, good old Bob plans a picnic for the kids. And Telly and Harry. Unfortunately though, a downpour starts outside. It looks as though we've planned for everything. Everything! Everything but the rain! Oh. rain. Harry Monster is understandably disappointed, but in order to make up for the bad weather, Bob quickly decides to host the picnic inside his apartment. Aww. Despite everything though, almost every one of Harry's lines throughout the entire episode is continually complaining, and it gets tiring very quickly. Well, Bob, there's no grass or trees in your apartment. Yeah. That's not the same. I realize he's meant to emulate a stick-in-the-mud kid, but it would have been nice if he was just a tiny bit grateful for Bob's attempts. But he just won't stop moaning, hurting the experience for the other kids and Telly. Even when a random game show breaks out in the apartment, which was yet another of Sesame Street's awesome sketches, he just moans some more. Are we having a nice day or what? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we're not having a nice day. By the halfway mark, Harry's gotten really tiresome. I mean, seriously, Harry, give Bob a break. He's trying everything he can to make up for this. What, do you want him to have a weather machine? Eventually, Harry gets so mopey that he decides to go home, and the momentary peace and quiet is welcomed. He does later come back to start coloring with the others, but not before jabbing in one final complaint. Jeez, dude. Yeah, it's me again. <laughs> yeah, I was even more boring at home. I guess it could be taken as a lesson to the kids that they may sometimes have friends that just won't budge, compromise, or participate. But overall, the moral felt forced here, and it was pretty cringy to watch. I think what the writers should have done is show that Harry can sometimes enjoy some activities inside Bob's apartment. That way the audience still learns to be grateful for the thought, rather than just what happens. But again, when a kid's show produces 4,561 episodes, and only has a few minor duds, that's like a freaking impossible miracle of television history. History. I love this neighborhood! Yes. And for the fourth worst PBS Kids episode, Thomas and Friends Wonky Whistle. Ugh. When the Thomas series made the transition from real train models to CGI, a whole lot of the Thomas community didn't take the change very well, and I can definitely understand why. While the CGI looks 
okay for a television series. The writing quality of many of the newer episodes just felt lazy compared to the older episodes. Newer episodes often felt more formulaic and didn't seem to understand how trains work even at an elementary level. This episode revolves around Thomas needing to take a car full of animals to the country fair while telling the locals of Sodor to attend. But Thomas is so excited to get started that he bolts out of the steamworks while workers were still repairing his broken whistle, causing a tragic loss of life that will never be forgotten in the show's history. Nah, I'm just joshing you. They just topple over. You see, Thomas causes a massive, potentially deadly accident for the workers in the steamworks, and the episode treats it as if nothing happened. Normally in this show, there's a consequence behind the engine's recklessness. But that's all forgotten here in an event that could have led to multiple lives being lost in the real world. Also, while I'm nitpicking, a big cow, ducks, and a dog are all placed in the same train car, which obviously in real life would lead to half your cargo being smushed by cow hooves. Thomas's wonky whistle scared Farmer McCall's prize cow. But here, of course, everything's magically okay. These are all normally key events in a Thomas story, yet they're given all the importance here of a Family Guy cutaway gag. Well. This is unacceptable. This issue leads to my main problem with the episode's writing, as Thomas has suddenly become completely moronic. Not only does he deliberately ignore Topham Hat's direction to have his whistle fixed, but he also keeps whistling repeatedly throughout the episode, scaring away all the animals in the improperly locked train car. The people try to warn Thomas, but he just keeps going. Thomas! Thomas thought the station master was calling to say hello. This isn't even reckless, this is just plain stupid. Only when he arrives at the country show does he finally realize his mistake and has to enlist the help of the farmers to retrieve the animals. It's just so distracting how stupid Thomas has become in this episode. And he faces no repercussions and doesn't even understand he could have killed people. Not only does Thomas risk the lives of several workers, but he risks the farmers losing their livestock. A cavalcade of poor characters and bad safety practices, Wonky Whistle stands as the most infamous episode in the entirety of Thomas's history. And hopefully this mostly fantastic show doesn't have another stinker episode like this. I am a very silly engine. <laughs> ah, and for the third worst, Arthur's Big Hit. Third time's the charm, right? This is probably the most infamous episode of Arthur in its entire 24 year runtime. But first, big disclaimer, I obviously don't condone hitting people unless it's defense of yourself or others. But with that obvious fact out of the way, why is this episode so infamous? Well, the writers managed to completely fumble the most basic, simple moral in the world. Don't hit your siblings. They literally could have just said that and we would have had a better moral. The story centers on Arthur spending a week building a model plane, with of course, DW bugging him during the entire process. But rather than Arthur at any point mentioning to his parents about it, he just tells DW to leave the room. The building continues and Arthur begins to seethe with anger. And DW, being the most annoying sister of all time, keeps prodding him endlessly. Is that the same broken plane you were fixing yesterday? Don't. Like, seriously, I always thought the idea of a sister would be awesome, but DW single-handedly almost made me change my mind on that. I swear, DW makes Angelica look positively charming. Anyway, the last straw is when Arthur finishes the plane and DW tosses the plane outside, believing it could fly. And kablammo! Airplane Massacre. When Arthur finds this model plane he spent a week building in pieces, DW continues to nag him. You built it all wrong! Did you even read the directions? Holy cow girl, what is wrong with you? Do you possess any remorse whatsoever? Anyway, finally Arthur snaps and punches her. I told you not to touch it! Now, I say punch, but honestly, this is the most buggy, broken, censored punch I've ever seen in cartoon history. Even by four kids' standards, it is kind of implied that Arthur is punching DW, and only two frames of animation were actually given to DW falling down. Nice work, guys. That was the most important key scene of the episode, and you botched it. Anyway, understandably, their folks aren't pleased, and the parents ground Arthur. And they probably give DW candy. I, I don't know. We never see. Are they gonna have to amputate my arm? I'm afraid so, DW. The arm has got to go. I fear you may never break another model plane again. Unless you, you know, use the other arm. 
Anyway, the main issue people have with this episode is how incredibly unbalanced this whole hitting story conflict is. The story is so broken that it actually manages to make it feel like Arthur's almost in the right here. And we really shouldn't be trying to get the viewer to side with the attacker. Like again, don't hit your siblings. It's a pretty straightforward moral writers. But because DW has written so unbelievably annoying, selfish and malicious, and goes out of her way to destroy everything her brother loves with no signs of remorse whatsoever, some audiences may well side with Arthur. Perhaps kids should understand why Arthur was wrong to hit his sister? But all he ever hears is... But what you did is wrong, too. See, in psychology we call that authoritarian parenting rather than authoritative. Even criminal courts account for provocation and assault. See, only Arthur receives any punishment in this episode. As I said, DW just receives attention and knowing the parent's probably an ice cream. If the parents had assessed the situation for a second and given both Arthur and DW a suitable punishment, it would have been a fine moral for the episode. But when Arthur later gets punched by a bully at school, what do the parents say? Well, maybe that's how DW felt when you punched her. But what's that got to do with this? Chief, as you guys are bad at this. If your kid gets punched by the school bully, you probably shouldn't tell them, well, that's what you get. We want to teach kids that violence isn't the solution to their problems. But this episode just fumbles the ball so terribly it makes me dislike Arthur's parents. Never a cop when you need one. And the second Ow. worst PBS Kids episode is... Caillou. Caillou joins the circus. So Caillou decided to look himself up on Wikipedia. To tell you the truth, I probably could have filled this entire list with Caillou episodes. In fact, it got loads of mentions when I asked the community for suggestions on Twitter. But I kept it minimal for the sake of variety and your sanity. But if you want to talk about infamous episodes of kids' cartoons, look no further than here. Let's start with the first floor. False advertising to kids. Despite the very title of this episode, it doesn't actually feature Caillou joining the circus at all. We don't even see the circus outside of his dream. Instead, the episode focuses on Caillou throwing a huge tantrum over getting Ray to go to the circus a day earlier than scheduled. The circus? Oh no, Caillou, that's not today. The circus isn't till tomorrow. But I swear Caillou's parents are smoking joints or something, because they just indulge his tantrum as usual. Come on, Caillou. Come downstairs and help me make breakfast. No! No, I don't want to! You see, Caillou now gets to have his own circus in his home with his family. This episode encapsulates why so many people, particularly parents, despise this show. Despite Caillou's awful behavior over something so minor, his parents completely indulge this behavior. Even Family Guy points this out. Caillou's low testosterone father again indulged Caillou's tantrum, clearly trying to raise a sociopath. If anything, this episode could teach children that it doesn't matter if they misbehave, because their parents will not care or respond with positive reinforcement. Caillou's parents are using what's known as permissive parenting, giving their children little to no boundaries. This episode is often singled out as a perfect example of Caillou's toxic behavior. Articles have been written about parents' frustrations with the show, and how their kids had begun to mimic some of Caillou's bratty behavior after watching it. So not only is this show offensive to the ears with Caillou's incessant whining, but this episode can also be considered dangerous for young children to watch. And before number one, here's to a quick honorable and dis dis dishonorable mention. Clifford, tough enough. This episode's actually considered the worst of Clifford the Big Red Dog, but honestly, it seemed fine to me. The episode itself centers around T-Bone wanting to prove to his owner that he can be a tough dog, but learns that he doesn't have to act tough, and that many people like him as he is. You know, usual nice morals for a kid's cartoon. He loves me, just the way I am. If this is the worst that Clifford has to offer, then the series as a whole must be amazing. The entirety of Teletubbies. Holy. Bessie cow gods, I hate this show. What was the reason this show was allowed to air alongside actual educational shows? Teletubbies is such an anomaly of television that's difficult to even describe to you. It makes Barney the Dinosaur look morbid and worldly. It's a show with no plot, no conflict, no character, or any dialogue beyond brainless babbling. Uh -oh. 
A few years ago, I cancelled ever doing the worst kids show video purely because I never wanted to have to review a single episode of this garbage. Calling it a drug trip is an insult to drug trips. All I can say is it's more likely to make toddlers stupider. Considering this show doesn't have any real plot or even coherent dialogue, pretty much every single episode is garbage and the most unchallenging piece of dreck I've ever seen for kids. Please don't ask me to ever review it. Ever. Anyway, on to number one. And without a doubt, the number one worst PBS Kids episode is... Caillou. Big Brother Caillou. Oh no, we're not done with this brat yet. He's an outright shame to PBS's five-star reputation for 26 years, and I've got a major bone to pick with this episode. Because it's so terrible, I felt queasy just watching one of the scenes. Just a warning ahead, this does contain a somewhat disturbing scene that I need to show you to demonstrate why this is number one. And yes, we are still talking about a Caillou PBS Kids episode. Big Brother Caillou, despite its pleasant-sounding title, is an episode full of Caillou at his absolute worst. And yes, for Caillou, that means really bad. Not only does he whine constantly during the episode once he meets his newborn sister Rosie, but grows violently jealous of the attention she receives. You see, Caillou painfully pinches his infant sister on the face in a surprisingly disturbing scene. Again, apologies. Why would they think anyone wants to see infants screaming in pain, and not see this little horror punished even slightly for it? Though believe it or not, this is actually an improvement over the original book the episode is based on, where this crazy Canadian psychopath bites his newborn sister on the face. Ugh, that is gruesome. But anyway, despite Caillou being disturbingly violent against his baby sister, his bizarrely permissive father just hugs him and says that his sister will bow to his whims once she's old enough to comprehend his presence. His parents don't even try to teach him about how they'll still love him, even with their new child. Or that maybe he shouldn't bite or pinch his infant sister? Between the horribly messed up moral, terribly written characters, cringingly permissive parents, and Caillou's insufferable voice and behavior. I don't like Rosie. Rosie doesn't play with me. There is absolutely no benefit to anyone watching this episode, and certainly not impressionable young kids. I have a new appreciation for those Caillou Go Animate videos. In other episodes, he might be an annoying brat that never gets punished, but this episode shows him physically harming an infant. At this point, I'm actually missing Peppa Pig. That's how low the bar is now. She's an angel by comparison to this little monster. There's even an organization called the PAC, Parents Against Caillou, because unlike shows on Disney and Nick Jr., Caillou is utterly helpless to everything. There's never any attempt in this show to teach self-reliance or problem-solving. Caillou simply whines until his helicopter parents come to the rescue. This episode is, without a doubt, the worst episode of a PBS cartoon I've ever seen. But anyway, with that aside, PBS has grown and taught so many kids at this point, it's astounding. I mean, it's the network that hosted Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street for over two decades. Whether their lessons range from educational or social, PBS has steered a lot of people right for many years. And I think it's also important to mention, I wish PBS kids the absolute best and thank them for all they've contributed to giving people years of both comfort and growth. And it's my hope they continue to educate people of all ages for years to come. And if you think I missed any other bad PBS episodes, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Ow.